Right, well, well, welcome, Alan. I just have to go through a, a, a few little bits and pieces to introduce everybody and explain that firstly, the whole session is being recorded uh, so that it can be seen later by other people. Uh, if you don't want to be visible in that recording, you can switch your stop video button, which you've found. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> if everybody can stay muted and, and uh, ask questions using the chat box, which is down at the bottom of the screen. And uh, if you use chat just like a text, and then we'll pass the questions on. Uh, and Steve has helpfully put to everybody to use the chat facility, yes. Uh, and the other thing that will make it easier for you is if you go on to speak of you, then the person that's speaking will be the big box. And I hope you do enjoy. So now introducing Alan Pilkington, the owner and uh, layout owner of Truck Street. So I hope you've been able to watch the video of Truck Street, uh, a fascinating video. Thank you very much for supplying the video, Alan. And if anybody's got any questions, please go ahead and ask them. In the meantime, Alan, um, how did you come to the concept of Crook Street? Well, it's an interesting one, actually. Um, I was kind of compelled into it in a way because um, I had a layout in a, um, in a, previous, a previous incarnation of our conservatory, which uh, wasn't a very good conservatory. Um, and anyway, it started to fall down, so um, I thought, I need to uh, I need to find somewhere else to put a railway um, because planning permission was withdrawn for, <laughs> for, a, for a railway in the new in the new conservatory. Um, we had this ghastly dark cellar, so um, I uh, I did some research online and found that um, in London there's a whole industry built up around. Um, tanking cellars because the people of London want to extend their real estate downwards and um, it's actually it's effectively big boys bubble wrap so you encase the cellar in big boys bubble wrap and if your cellar really floods badly you can put a pump in there as well but mine doesn't so that's okay so I did that papered over it and hey presto I had a wonderful railway room now the thing with it is is it's only 13 foot long, so it's quite small. Um, however, um, I've always quite liked through stations, and my previous layout was indeed a through station to begin with. But then, like all of us railway modelers, we keep extending, and I extended it into a terminus. And what I found uh, when I was operating was that, um, although the, the spectacle of trains passing in a through station is, is very nice and very appealing, it's not nearly as entertaining as manipulating the trains in the terminus. So I ummed and hard for ages and ages uh, with the, the cellar, which by the way is intruded into by a, a, a supporting wall. So I don't have a full square cellar. I've got a kind of L shape. And um, I came up with it, uh, loads of cell searching, loads of digging around on template and such. Uh, I came up with a terminus design and um, the inspiration for that, I've always kind of liked, I've always liked the London Northwestern for a long, long time. Um, I did go through a short phase of, um, of Great Western, but I'm cured of that now. And um, so I've always liked the London Northwestern. I've always liked the, the, uh, the Northwest of England uh, in terms of its urban settings. I always like urban settings as well. So um, places like Birkenhead Woodside and Bolton Great Moor Street as relatively small London Northwestern terminuses. Um, they always inspired me as, as, as places to places to model. And I looked at um, Bolton Great Moor Street. I think there was there was there was a guy, I don't know, it must be in the 1980s now, um, who built a model of Bolton Great Moor Street and um, released some uh, some books about it. Um, which I only ever saw in kind of adverts. Where I thought to myself, what a wonderful little place that was. And um, did a lot of digging on that over years and thought to myself, if, I, if ever I build another railway, I'm going to try and build a model of Bolton Great North Street. Mm -hmm. Of course, getting hold of books on, on, on the place, and it's huge. <laughs> it's like a lot of things. If you try and do these things um, to scale, 
you need a, you know, you need a barn uh, or an aircraft hangar. Um, and my 13 foot cellar, I'm not going to be able to do that. So it was out with template and a case of, um, again, something I think a lot of us railway modelers do, and I've certainly done for, for as long as I can remember, planning railways to see what can be fitted in. Now, there's a school of thought uh, that says that what you should do is, you know, have, fit your, your railway into the landscape. And what you should never do is fill every inch of the baseboard with track. Uh, I'm afraid I'm a v <laughs> fill every inch of the baseboard with track mentality. So uh, my, you know, pretty much every inch of that baseboard is filled with track. Yeah. Uh, um, I, can I just confirm when you say certainly. the size of your cell is 1313. Is that right? Not yeah, it is. Yeah, one three. Yeah, yes, it is indeed. Yeah, one three. Just yeah, it, it asked. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a small layout. Um, yeah, a lot of cunning, cunning deception to make it look bigger than it is. And uh, anyway, so playing around with template, um, I managed to squeeze in. I guess. I guess at this point, I, I ought to add that on my previous layout, um, it was. It was just over seven foot wide, uh, and I managed to get a curve in there into a um, uh, a terminus station. Now it was always problematical, <laughs> I'll admit. First of all, um, but what I had in the cellar was, um, you know, happy days. I've got uh, more room to make um, slightly less tight curves. Um, what and, is your minimum uh, radius? Well, the minimum rate minimum radius is an interesting question. Notice how I'm hesitating here because I haven't got the template up and I can't actually remember. But the the radius of the um, of the main lines, uh, the two main running lines, I think that the inner one, the low, the smaller radius, is about five and a half feet. The outer one is six foot, so the inner one is about five inches or so less than that. But we've got sidings inside that that are even less again. And the road, the, the line leading to um, Deansgate, the one that goes down the, uh, the little dip that you may have seen in the videos, uh, that one's just a little bit over three foot. Um, and pretty much everything will traverse it. Um, the, the challenge on building the railway was building one of the, the, the key elements of the track plan was the uh, you know the thing that gives access from the fiddle yard to everything else uh it's the um double slip on a curve which is always a bit uh, a bit interesting um so i <laughs> when i built it originally um i built just a straightforward double slip on a curve uh, now the inside curve of that is about four foot so it's tight and um, all of my stock would fall off on that. So I decided that what I needed to do was to build it into um, a, uh, a, a switch diamond. And so far it's worked very well. Um, the, 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 the crossings are narrowed down to um, uh, 31.5 millimeters. And sometimes the longer, rate, the longer wheelbase engines struggle a bit with the, um, the the crossing on traversing the uh, the slip road with, with the tight curve but um judicious work with um with a file has enabled that crossing to take most of my engines <laughs> uh, it's all a compromise isn't it but um do you spend yeah, so, compensation on your locos or yeah, I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the one engine that didn't have compensation uh, was the very first engine I built, which was uh, an old Eric Hunt Underhill kit of the, um, uh, the Rams bo bottom 060 uh, special tank. And uh, it used to do well. So, uh, and it was a solid chassis. So I, I, I took the body off and hacked around with the chassis and turned it into a compensated chassis and bought some new rods and jointed rods and all the rest of it. Now it, it loves it. it, it it's quite happy going around some, um, some uh, eye-wateringly tight curves. So it's uh, all is good. So I guess the message there for um, uh, us space strap railway modelers is 
you can get away with quite a lot um, with rolling stocks. I've got some challenging engines to build in the future. Um, I've got one of um, um, Mercian's uh, Renown kits, uh, the Renown, LNWR Renown locomotive, which is a 440. Now, the problem with that engine is it doesn't have cutouts for the uh, the bogey to to swing so i'm gonna have to go do some um interesting uh, interesting jiggery pokery with the chassis on that <laughs> my current thinking is um a little bit of um uh, chassis um uh, shrinkage may go on there so there's a so it'll enable it to traverse around the curve but we'll see we'll you know it's all kind of miniature engineering you can there's all sorts of things you can do before you get into the realm of really drastic stuff. But that's probably going to be the, the biggest bet in a while. But my 080s will traverse that quite happily. Excellent. Because uh, that's, that's one of the exits from the, the goods yard. So um, it, they all sort of uh, get traversed around there. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I've always, going back to the kind of layout planning and conceptual conceptuality of it, is that one of the things I've always... Well, I certainly learned over the years. I didn't start off this way. I made all the mistakes like we do. Um, but one of the things that um, uh, I've always felt is is important is is being able to operate the railway in a in a, a realistic manner, or at least a realistic manner that, that suits me. There's any number of compromises, but hey ho. And um, key to that is making sure you've got a balance between your fiddle yard and the rest of the railway. Because there's nothing worse than finding that um, you know you need to get up and, and fiddle with the trains every five minutes, and you know you can't. Um, uh, you've got more siding space than you have fiddle yard space, or vice versa. So I managed to get away with a four road fiddle yard, which again is is quite um, is quite small, but the balance of that works quite well, and I'm able to run um, a large number of oh, what appears to, what. What for me is quite a large number of trains between uh, between fiddle sessions. So the way the, the, the what I've done is and the way I the, the way I generated the, the the railway is to come up with a what will fit track plan, then come up with um, a a fiddle yard design in terms of number of roads. Again, I've got space limitations there. The access stair, stairs intrudes into the space occupied by the, the, the fiddle yard. So the fiddle yard actually hangs over the bottom stairs of the access stair. So I can't make it too wide. And it's up against the wall, so I have trouble with swing as well, because it's a sector plate. Anyway, um, so the next thing to do was to sit down and work out timetables. And for me, that's a really important exercise. Um, <laughs> it's a bit kind of techy and nerdy. You sit there with spreadsheets and um, plans of moving train X from road one into siding number three. But it's actually quite an, it, 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 I find it quite an entertaining thing to do. And it sort of brings the concept of the layout to life. So many a happy evening has been spent <laughs> um, dreaming up uh, any number of uh, train moves. Uh, but trying at the same time to, to keep it kind of realistic um, uh, and work a kind of a timetable which would um, would be the sort of timetable you'd expect to see in a in a in a in a in a mill town in the 1920s. Um, and I was able to come up, come up with I think 20 pages worth of timetable, with each page being a running session and the end of each page being a fiddle session. And um, having done all that was, uh, was really interesting. I was quite happy with that. And everything was fine. And from that, you can derive what rolling stock you're going to need and how many engines you're going to need. And um, I think my, my engine list runs to 25 engines. I don't have 25 engines. I've got, I think, 13 built at the moment and about another seven kits to build. Um, so what you can do when you've got your master timetable of, of how everything is going to be in the, in the grand future um, is that you can start chopping engines out and run a restricted timetable, which is what I do and what you've seen in the videos. Nevertheless, that's still extremely busy. However, anyway, um, having done all that, I then managed to get hold of the Dennis Sweeney books, uh, 
Um, and and there's another cop, there's another one in the series written by another guy whose name I forget, all about Claude Lane. And within those books is contained some extracts of the working timetables. They're not full working timetables, but they're extracts from them. And in there also are some references to the kind of traffic that flowed on the, the two lines that came out of um, Bolton Great Moor Street. And I thought, what a great idea it would be if I could superimpose the real working timetables on my own self-constructed timetable. Would it work? And lo and behold, another happy, happy few evenings. Probably quite a, quite a, a lot of evenings, actually. Um, happy few evenings were spent shoehorning the, the real working timetables onto my timetable. And I was quite surprised at how tolerant the layout was to accommodating that with my four-row, you know, relatively small fill yard uh, and a much more restricted um, uh, layout than the real Great Moor Street and, and the real Crook Street, which is the, the very ex on a quite extensive goods yard, which um, uh, uh, is adjacent to Crook Street. I found that I could accommodate the trains. Um, so um, I'm really pleased with that. So there's all sorts of quirky things uh, that happen on the, on the railway um, that are quirks of the real timetable. So I'm quite pleased with that. The pig train being one of them. If you're, if you're familiar with my YouTube channel, um, beware youtube channel uh, uh, um, uh, um, promotion coming up so it's lnwr crook street uh, and you'll see uh, the pig train featured there and um, so that's a bit of a mystery train to try and figure out what on earth that really was were they transporting pigs around was it pig iron for the steelworks there who knows um but in addition to that i've also um uh, i've also indulged indulged in the in the the freelance nature of the railway. So I've used Crook Street and Bolton Great Moor Street as kind of models for this, but it's not a model of either of those two places. But what it does is use their location to be able to give some credibility to the layout and run the same kinds of trains. So it's kind of Bolton, but in my world. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm getting asked a question here. From sure. Giles Brown. Is the track laid straight onto your plywood or, or how have you laid the track and what have you Hi, Giles. Passed? Hi, Giles. Yeah, it, it, the short answer is yes, it's laid directly onto the, onto the plywood or to be more specifically, it's laid onto uh, paper printouts glued down of the, of the track pot, of the template um, plan. Yeah, I, I've never used foam insulating insulation um i think the argument is that oh, it makes the trains quieter and all the rest of it i don't really like them quiet i quite like them to rumble in and it, it, it's quite i haven't got i haven't used dcc sound although i'm kind of coming around to thinking that maybe um but i quite like the idea of my trains rumbling into the station which they do in a, in a rather satisfying way they don't sound too good on the um on the video, the video didn't really pick that out. But uh, when you listen to them in real life, and I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure on your own layout, uh, if you've got one, um, you you find the same. The, the, the trains, particularly in O gauge, and probably O gauge is the smallest gauge where this is going to happen. The trains have a nice weight and and kind of sound to them. So um, I found laying the track directly on the ballast not to be a problem at all. Um, and yeah, so the, what I used to, to ballast it and what I've used for this, and it, it was an experiment on this layout to do this. I didn't do this in the previous one. I just used ballast out of a, you know, commercially available ballast. And what I've used with this was, because there's quite a lot of it, is, um, is, uh, is cement, you know, a, a, a mortar mix, you know, from a, DI, from a DIY shed. And I had, so I did, I had some, I did some work in the, you know, DIY stuff in the in the garden, and had some left over. And I thought oh, I use that because all you do is put water in it, it goes off, and it sets well, like water, like concrete, <laughs> like concrete. Yeah, not quite concrete. You don't want to use concrete. Don't use concrete, guys. <laughs> concrete shrinks and does all sorts of strange things, and it's quite a caustic caustic thing. But um, yeah, so I use that um, as a kind of initial layer, and then over the top of that, I'll sprinkle ballast where it's needed. And or just leave it 
in its raw state. And the, the beauty of that method is, is that uh, for the different kinds of track you've got on your layout, so the main line obviously is going to be nicely ballasted, although in a station like Crook Street, the ballast would be, you know, filled with lots of manky oil and stuff like that. So it wouldn't quite be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be kind of nice mainline ballast. Um, but for places like the steam shed, um, well, that's just going to be ash anyway. And in station and uh, places like the, the sidings, that sidings did get ballasted, but they very quickly became a kind of mix of grime and ash and all the rest of it. So with this methodology, you've got the, the option of, either putting a full layer of ballast on for the main line or a partial layer for places like sidings and like the line to Crook Street, for example, uh, the line to Deansgate, for example. Um, or you can just leave it as is uh, and either paint it um, matte grey, which I've done for the, the, the engine set, uh, the, the steam shed, or a combination of kind of grotty light greys, browns, that kind of thing for the, um, uh, for the sidings. So I find that nothing... How do you do Say that? again, sorry. How, how do you do that painting with a spray brush or with a? With no, no. <laughs> I um, I've never quite got round to buying a um, uh, an airbrush. Um, so no, I'm, I'm I'm a bit old school. I use um, I use uh, uh, ordinary hand paint brushes. Um, I think you use an old artist's brush because it'll fit into um, it'll fit into Humbrol tins. So um, yeah. Uh, I'm quite slow on the uptake there, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's all hand painted. So I'll have I'll have a session where I where I effectively gas myself with paint, uh, and then go and spend some time recovering in the garden or something, <laughs> or some doing ballasting. But yeah, because yeah. it was uh, there was a question: How is your weathering done? Oh, right. Okay. Um, okay. Well, weathering is an interesting one. Of course, it depends on. What, you, what things you're weathering. So on the track, everything, everything I do is brush painted. There's, I don't have an airbrush. Um, obviously, rattle cans are you know, good for weathering. They're, they're too big. Um, uh, so everything's done with, a, with a, a paintbrush. And for the track, I have a sort of mix, which I've come up with over the years um, of, you know, lots of trial and error and practice over numerous layouts of, of the year. I've been building railway models, or model railways rather, oh, since I was a kid. I, th I think I had my train set out one time when I was about six and I just kind of never put it away. Um, so I've been building ever since. <laughs> In one, even when I was a student, I built a model railway, which probably explains why my results weren't too chipper. But, um, anyway, um, yeah, the, the, the sort of brew that I use for, uh, for track, uh, again, I've used Humbrol enamels forever and ever. I've got used to them. I know there's other ranges of enamel, enamels out there, and I have experimented with those, and they're exactly the same. There's no problem. I've not really – I don't really want to restart the learning curve of acrylics. So I've got a bunch of techniques in it that I'm familiar with with, uh, with uh, enamels, so they're the ones I use. And my kind of brew for track – is to slosh on, I've always got a bottle of, um, of uh, terps on hand, uh, white spirit on hand, which I use as a, as a, uh, to dilute them. I think you're supposed to use thinners, but I don't think I've ever bought thinners in my life. But anyway, um, I'm not one for following received wisdom, but hey-ho. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I'll slosh on, I'll kind of do this in, I don't know, one foot sections. So I don't, don't want to do it all, all at once because I don't want everything to dry all at once. So I'll slosh on a dilute mix of dark earth. Um, I can't remember what number it is, 29. Um, and then I'll slosh on a combination, I'll mix it on the track of dark earth and tan. Can't remember what number tan is. Um, hold on, I'll tell you, I've got them by now. Uh, tan is 62. Um, so tan and dark earth, I'll slosh on the, uh, the track sides. Um, so everything's still wet at this point. Uh, the, sorry, the rail sides. So that makes up my rusty rails look. I know you can get rail colour and all the rest of it, but I'm not so keen on that. Um, again, a lot of this is, you know, is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, and then finally what I'll do is I'll slosh on some dilute uh, matte grey, which I think is 67, which I use for everything. Um, 
it's a really good colour. It's kind of browny grey, you know, it's not blue grey, it's not green grey, it's probably slightly blue grey, but hey, I really like the colour. It's in, you know, it's everywhere. <laughs> my, my, my layout is an advert for it. But anyway, so I'll slosh that on, particularly focusing on the forefoot and the sleeper ends. So this is done kind of quickly um, so that it catches the sleeper ends, doesn't soak into the ballast too much. You know, around the, uh, around the point blades, I'll go heavy on it and the point blades, you know, I'll go lighter on it in areas where the, the, the traffic was lighter. Um, you know, you can vary it. And it's all done by kind of feel, really. And I'll also slosh, oh, <laughs> slosh, my favourite, the, the word of the day, guys. Um, you know, I'll draw some along the, the rail edges, which just give the chairs and the tops of the rails that little bit of dirty used look as though there's been lots of oil spillage on there on the tiny bit of slightly you know where the, where the trains are doing a uh, you know an eye watering 20 miles an hour um you know i've, I've just got lighter on it um, but my memory of of the railway i'm old but not that old i don't remember 1920 um but my memory of the railway when i used to work in the railway there's always a line of gunk in the middle of the forefoot uh, and I've tried to replicate that as well. So that's kind of how to do it for track. Um, buildings is a whole other story with buildings. <laughs> buildings, are buildings are probably a half hour, if not an hour session in themselves. I told you I could go on, Tony. Um, yeah, buildings, there's a, there's a, particularly the brick buildings, uh, there's a particular technique I've used, which I've only really perfected or perfected, uh, got to my liking. Um, on, on this layout um, uh, uh, for the brickwork uh, because I particularly wanted to replicate crew brick. Mm -hmm. And um, if anyone's familiar with crew brick or knows anything about brickwork, then there'll be you know, technical reasons for this. I've got a geology degree, so I know a little bit about, about why the brick is how it is. Um, but uh, cr the, the thing about crew brick and the appearance of crew brick that always struck me um, as I say, many years ago when I, when I worked in the railway um, back in the 1970s was how speckled it was. It was speckled with kind of white stuff. And it's interesting many years later now, uh, looking at the, um, the, uh, the fashion for reclaimed brick in all sorts of places, the uh, propensity for, for white bricks. Now, whether these are X kind of painted bricks, who knows? Um, uh, it's, lime, it's, it's lime blowing is the real reason, but we won't go into that. Uh, but crew brick was always speckled. So how to replicate that? And the sad truth of it is, there's there's no kind of easy way. You've just got to spend a lot of time going quietly insane, painting individual bricks. And uh, yeah, maybe that's why I'm in a cellar. <laughs> I've never noticed the bars at the top. Um, so yeah. It has, it has been a fascinating interview. We are just about again? Out, we are just about out of time. Oh, are you? sorry. Yeah, I could go on. Uh, there was just one quick question, though, uh, sure. about your signals and points. How do you operate your signals and points? Well, it's a mixture. Um, the uh, the uh, there's there's kind of everything. There's a bit of everything here. There's there's a mechanical method which I use for signals, which are kind of directly from the lever frame. You know, directly in line with the the levers and that's just a, a series of rods and cranks and i've used um model aircraft snakes which are effectively boarding tubes um uh, to act as the as the propulsion method uh, to either to push and pull the, uh, the the levers and cranks for the signals uh, for the signals that are less remote so the the gantry by the exit bridge and the the big down home bracket they're operated by um, uh, mega points controllers, servo units, and servers, and um, so are some of the uh, rotating ground signals. And some of the rotating ground signals are hand operated as well, just using cranks. They need to turn through ninety degrees, so that's you know it's a case of setting those up. Points are the the nearer ones are operated by uh, mechanical methods again, rather like the signals. And I've used tortoise point motors and um, the other ones, whose name I can't remember. <laughs> DCC control cell them. 
<laughs> and them. Um, Maybe the cobalt ones. Cobalt, they would be the ones. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's cobalt as well. The thing I find about them is with a bit, a bit dismaying is that they make a hell of a noise. So in the videos, you've got a constant hum, which is a bit of, yes. yeah. But I'll just turn the volume up on the ambient sound. Well, I, I hope that helps, guys. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for sh letting us use your videos of your layout in the show. Uh, no problem. The question and answer session. Uh, and also thank you to everybody that's come and taken part and asked some very, very good questions. All right, I'm afraid I'm going to have, to, we're running out of time and I've got to go to another Zoom meeting in a minute. So thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers now. Bye everyone. Goodbye. All right then. Thank you. Bye bye now.